I want to say thank you to all of you for being here. Um, I'm Maggie Kramer. I am the pre-K-6 manager for the Edmonds School District. And my job, just to kind of give you a summary of it, is to really work with our preschool all the way through our sixth grade teachers around um, teaching and learning and standards and curriculum. Um, but I actually, this year, my favorite part of my job has been working with the preschool and kindergarten teachers. I learned a tremendous amount. and. It's so funny, even my family will say, the days that I get to go out and be in our preschool classrooms and our kindergarten classrooms, I come home in such a better mood. So um, for all of you preschool and kindergarten teachers, thank you for this year. Thank you for the past two years. I appreciate every minute of it. So um, tonight is really a culminating night for us. We've really, for two years in, at the Edmonds School District, been studying um, a play-based model of instruction, and we call it in Edmonds here, um, Plan to Reflect. And this is a, a really thinking about what play looks like in preschool and bringing it into our kindergarten classrooms. And we've engaged in some common learning, and we've visited each other's classrooms, and I can tell you, because I just spent all day last Wednesday in some of our kindergarten classrooms videotaping for a video that we're making, and I saw the most amazing things. I'll tell you, I was in classrooms where they were outside and they had taken like rain gutters and made these giant ramps. And they had tennis balls and they had marbles and they were testing to see how things would go. And I saw kids building things and trying things and so excited. And almost every single kid that I interviewed, I pull, would pull them out and I'd say, would you come talk to me on the camera? And some of them were scared and some of them weren't. And I would say, tell me what your favorite part of kindergarten is. And almost every single kid said, plan to reflect. And I would say, a lot of kids said math, too, which I think is really exciting. But a lot of them said plan to reflect. And they said they liked playing. They liked creating things. They liked trying things. And I think that's really powerful. And I think it shows all the work that's been happening in our, in our classrooms across the district. Um, tonight, I have, we've invited parents as well. And I know May is crazy. My husband, who's an elementary school principal, calls May mayhem because every single night you have something. And so families and teachers, I appreciate you taking the time. Please eat lots and lots of food and take some home to your families. But we've invited um, Jody McBitty to come. And she is local and comes highly recommended from some of the preschool directors that I work with on a regular basis. And she's going to come and talk to us about the importance of play and relationships with our kids and give us some ideas for strategies and language that we can use. And I think it's going to be a really great way to wrap up this year with some practical things, some theoretical things, and just some great um, things that we can carry for those of us who are teachers into our classrooms, for those of us who are teachers and parents, and for those of us who are parents, because I know I struggle and say the wrong thing all the time with my own children. So some things that we can try immediately, tonight, tomorrow morning, when we're, when we're with our kids. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jody, and I'd like us to give her a warm welcome and say thank you. Thanks, Peggy. Yeah. <clears throat> so welcome, everybody. Uh, just a brief introduction. I am a family doc by training. Um, and I left the practice of medicine in 1996 and have been working in schools ever since because I really have this passion for helping us build better communities and I think schools are really the front line of that and I am um, I run a program called Sound Discipline. It's a nonprofit out of Seattle, and we spend a lot of time doing professional development for teachers around trauma informed practice, culturally responsive classrooms, and how do you build a classroom community that fosters social learning and academic learning at the same time. So, most of our work is in South King County, but you can look us up on the internet. Um, and today what I'd like to do is integrate some of the work I do in schools and some of this with the whole idea of play and what is play doing with the brain. So we're going to bring it back to brain science. So how many of you are teachers? Great. And how many of you are parents? A few. Oh, quite a few. Okay. Some of you are both. So. <laughs> um, so we're not going to start out right away with play, but I'm going to kind of weave it through. And underneath it, what we're going to be doing is thinking about how a developing brain is growing and why play is so important to the developing brain. 
So I'm going to start out though with what kind of challenges you experience either in your house or your classroom. What are kids doing that push your buttons? And we'll just start with a list. And it turns out I gave this, um, I was at a workshop on Monday evening and uh, presenting and they took the tape out of my bag. So we'll just have to, I think I'll do this list divided into this way so we can see it. So what kind of things are bugging you? Yes. Okay, overly aggressive. I'll just repeat it so everybody can hear and so it goes on the tape. Mm-hmm. Back talk. Disruption. Disruption. Crying. <laughs> So they say so they just kind of impulsively pull everything together. Okay, so can I just put materials in giant pile? Yes. Okay. Anything else? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Shutting down. Mm-hmm. Defiant. Of course. One wants to eat this, one wants to eat exactly the opposite. One wants to go this direction, one wants it or 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 I wanna both they both want to sit in exactly the same spot, right? <laughs> so um, is it sibling you want me sibling rivalry, sibling tension? Mm -hmm. More stressed than usual than before. Mm -hmm. We see that too. You're not alone. Mm -hmm. That's their job, though. You know, they're testing boundaries. Any whining? No. <laughs> uh huh. Are you getting the idea here? There's a long list. A couple more. Manipulative. Manipulative. One more. Yeah. Tattling. Okay. All right. So now I'm going to ask you to switch hats for a minute. And I'm going to have you imagine that this infant or child that you're working with is now 18 or 19 years old and they, you see them in the community or they come back and visit. And what gifts or qualities do you want them to have? What, you want them to be independent. Compassionate. Responsible, I missed one. Resilient. Assertive? Yeah. Good, good decision maker. Make good decisions. Considerate. Respectful. Respectful. Humor. Curious. Oh, curious. Critical thinker. Maybe able to have friendships, you know, so some friendship skills. Anything else on that list? Confident. Maybe patient. Observant, so aware. Self-esteem. 
and we could go on. Now a lot of you are teachers and you spend somewhere between 40 and 60 hours a week teaching all sorts of academic content and I can do this with just an audience of teachers and you notice what's not on here? Math, reading, mm -hmm. academics. And it's not because there's a problem with what you do. It's because when you think about who you want them to be, you think about them as a human being and you want them to be a good neighbor. And parents want the same thing. This is what we want for our kids. And here's the craziness. This is what we have and this is what we want. And how are they going to learn that? How are they going to learn all these things? How do kids learn? Practice, exactly. And modeling. Right, do you guys know about mirror neurons? Mirror neurons? So mirror neurons are neurons that were discovered in the 90s and it turns out that all mammals have them. And when we see someone making an intentional action, our brain gets wired to do the same thing and we can play with them. So if everybody take a deep breath and put your shoulders back, put your eyes on me and you're going to do what I say and you're going to take your thumb and your finger and make a circle and then you're going to put it on your chin. And many of you have it on your cheek. And the reason you have it on your cheek is because you saw me do it and your mirror neurons just did it. So a lot of the things we do, it's how human beings, it's how mammals learn very quickly. And we adapt really quickly. So if you yawn, or so you see someone yawning, you'll notice that your body kind of wants to yawn. You can take a newborn baby, 40 minutes old, and stick your tongue out three times and the baby will stick his or her tongue out. We are born, at birth, we are wired to copy. And the interesting thing is that we're wired to copy emotionally as well as we're wired to copy physically. So if you have a good friend and you walk and you're meeting them at the coffee shop and you go, ooh, something's wrong, something's going on, you knew that through your mirror neurons before you knew it through your thinking. You can make sense of it, but you felt it before you thought it. Because that's how our mirror neurons work. So these mirror neurons are really powerful and what we do is really important. So when the kid takes the whole pile of toys and puts it in a big thump, you know, are we respectful, patient, courteous, and considerate? If we're having a good day, maybe. But not always, are we? When we're having a good day, we can do this pretty easily. When kids are having a good day, they can do this pretty easily. But when they're having a bad day, or when we're having a bad day, sometimes we don't respond in a way that models this. So one of the things that we can do is practice taking care of ourselves so that we can actually use these as opportunities to teach this. Does that make sense? Well, in order to do that, we have to kind of take care of ourselves. So I want to introduce one idea, and this is something you can teach. Um, we have had, about two years ago, I got an email from a preschool teacher who had a parent email them, and their four-year-old had spent half an hour at the t dinner table teaching the parents what I'm about to teach you. So four-year-olds can learn it pretty easily. So you don't need half an hour to learn it, but the four-year-old needed half an hour to explain it. Um, so what we're going to do is play with Dan Siegel's brain in the hand model. Do any of you, are any of you familiar with that? So the way it works is, imagine that my fist is like my brain. So this would be the front of my brain. This would be the base of my brain back here. This part of my brain back here is my brain stem. Freeze, fight, or flight, and the basic survival. The thumb across the middle, and you can do it with me because then you'll remember it better. The thumb across the middle is your midbrain, so your memories and your emotions and the amygdala, that warning system, am I safe or not safe? And then the fingers down, when you curl them, that part where your fingernails are is your prefrontal cortex. And your prefrontal cortex is where you can manage your own emotions, self-regulate. It's where you have your executive function. You've heard of the prefrontal cortex before, right? It's where you can have empathy, it's where you can have what we call response flexibility, in other words, making choices. But when your body perceives that it's under threat in some way, 
Since the prefrontal cortex takes a little time to process, it makes no sense for your brain to keep using that. So when you're under threat, the first thing that happens is you turn your prefrontal cortex off. You flip your lid. And when you flip your lid, are you operating from your thinking brain and your executive function? Mm -mm. Are you operating from your protective survival reptile brain? Can you make good choices? Mm -mm. Choices are not available here. Actually, all sorts of people tell me, you know, teachers tell me all the time, and I see this. When kids are like this, they know what to do. They will do it. When they're like this, they neither know what to do or do it. But when you talk to them later and they're like this, they can tell you what they should have done. They just didn't have access to it in the moment. So one of the things that's really important about what the work we all do with young children is when, because we have mirror neurons, they're actually learning to do this from us. So when a child comes in complaining or has had a bad day, either outside or at recess, you know, or on the school bus, and they come home and they're blah, 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 you know how they can be, or they're awful to their siblings, what is our mirror neuron response? Don't talk to me that like that young lady. Don't throw your backpack. Don't just, you know, pick yourself up. Or if we've had a bad day and we think, okay, I had a long day at work. My kids better be good tonight. And you're like this. What are the chances that the kids are going to be good? Zero. Because they're very sensitive to their mirror neurons. But the thing is that they work both ways. So if you have a child who comes to you like this, and you have a moment and you go, ooh, kid has a flipped lid. That's probably enough for you to calm down, to not join in. And when you're like this, and the kid's like this, what's going to happen to the child's brain? They can calm down. They learn to self-regulate through us. So there's lots of other things that kids do to learn to self-regulate. And we can think about their stress level and our stress level. In the morning, if things have gone relatively smoothly, stress levels are lower. Solving math problems, hard math problems, what's that going to do to our stress level? Goes up. Playing with friends, what's that going to do to our stress level? Goes down. And if you can think about your stress levels here and your flip your lid line is here, that space between it is the resiliency window. And one of the things that play does is it opens the resiliency window. So that's why play is partly self-regulating. But it's not just any play. So what we're going to do now, I need a volunteer to come be, I don't know, a, a three-year-old or a four-year-old with me. And what we're going to do, just so the rest of you can see, you may want to stand up, but we're going to pretend that this chair is a table. And we're going to pretend that I'm a parent and I'm going to do three role plays as a different parent each time to look at different kinds of play. And the person who's playing the three-year-old is going to play with the, I have some blocks and some dinosaurs in this bag and we'll just pretend, I mean I don't want to do it on the floor, but um, we'll just pretend that this is like a table. So who would be willing to come play with me? It won't take very long. Come on up. Right. Yeah. So we're going to pretend that this is the table. What's your name? Carlene. Carlene, I'm Jody. So your job is to just pretend that you're three and it's kind of a <coughs> wonky surface, but you're just going to play. And in this first role play, I'm just going to watch her every now and then. But what she really wants to do, what does she really want to do with me here? She wants to engage, but I'm busy. I'm either texting or reading my book. And what's going to happen after a while? She's going to bug me or she's going to get bored. Okay? That would be disengaged play. If kids need time to play by themselves. We're not talking about that, but this is a time when the adult who they care about is around. They want to connect. Okay, so here we're going to do a scene two. Okay, you can keep playing. 
Oh, but I think the block should go over here, don't you think? Let's make it. Let's make a, a door for this dinosaur, don't you think? But maybe, maybe we'll make it. Um, no, I actually, I think this one should go here, don't you think? <laughs> okay, so what just happened? I took over. You will see interactions. How many of you have seen adult-child interactions like that? Okay. It happens all the time, and it doesn't happen because I'm not a caring adult. It, we do it inadvertently, and, and no one does one or the other. But we often, because we want to teach, oh, can't you see how the ball rolls, and can't you see this, and, and we, we engage. Who led that discussion? <laughs> we have a little competition here. <laughs> okay, ready, scene three? Okay. What you got there? Blocks. You got some blocks? What are you building? Castle. You're building a castle. Do you think this dinosaur likes the castle? What do you think he's going to do? Uh-oh. Uh-oh. <laughs> no! Don't get me! Don't get me! I think I'm going to go hide! Now, can he see me? Ooh, I think... Oh. I think you have a pretty smart dinosaur! Okay, so now what happened? So that, that felt different, didn't it? It was more fun. Who led it that time? She led it, but I pushed her a little bit. So I engaged her and challenged her. It's not like I have to ha have her do everything. I can get in her way a little bit because she's going to be able to solve a problem if I get in the way. Not in a bad way. I, I monitored it. I didn't want to disappoint her. I didn't knock down her castle. But I might have said, ooh, who's coming to the castle? There's a little car here. You know, who's driving up? And we would create an imaginary story together. But I'm going to let her tell me instead of this is so-and-so. They always led with questions. So what did you notice as playing with me in three different scenarios? Um, the first, I felt alone, mm -hmm. and the second, I felt um, you were trying, but it wasn't going well, and then mm -hmm. the third, I felt happy. Mm -hmm. We were more connected, weren't we? Connected. Yeah. Connected, yeah. This, this need to connect is hardwired into human beings. Often kids will do things, and if she were, if you know, some kids, when I, when some adults, when they play the child in this game with me, when I'm ignoring them, they'll start bugging me. And I'll, our instinct is, or our tendency is to think, well, she just needs attention. She'll settle for attention. What she wants is connection. And you can keep that as kind of a rule. They talk about it in Circle of Security. Kids will settle for attention, but what they want is connection. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So what we're going to do tonight is talk about how connection by itself is a form of play. It can be a form of play. And to help you kind of be aware of who's leading the connection. And when kids are doing their, how do you call it there, something to reflect? Plan to reflect. Plan to reflect. Who is leading that? The kids are, aren't they? They're interacting and they're creating connections and then they're also doing some metacognitive thinking about it. And that's what's really growing their brain. So they're learning some academic skills of reflection, but they're doing it in a playful way. Okay, so we're going to do a little theory and then we're going to talk a little bit more about connection. So the work I do um, in schools and with families is, and I just want to pause for a second and just say, you know, I do this work a lot. We are all human beings. We are in this together. I, I don't really see myself as an expert. I, I make lots of mistakes all the time, too. And um, my oldest is now about to have a baby, so it's been a while since I had a little one at home. But when she was 10 years old, we had one of those days that you probably had that didn't go very well. It was one of those afternoons where she was upset and I was upset. She slammed her door and I slammed my door. 
And then after a few minutes, I heard this little paper come under the door. And it was a parent report card. <laughs> and it included things like, makes good smoothies, F minus. <laughs> takes care of, what were the little mini pets called that you had to poke, babysit? Yeah, something like that. Takes care of those, F minus. You know, neglection of eldest daughter, A plus. Um, this, and I was a parent educator at the time, right? This mother um, has much room for improvement. She should not be teaching parenting classes. So. So we all have these moments, and the goal here is not to be a perfect teacher or to be a perfect parent, but to be authentic and to know how to make repair our mistakes. So from that lens, you know, I hope we're all in it together. I hope you can reach out when you need help to the people around you, because it's not just kids who need to connect. It's all of us who need to connect. So the work I do is based on the theory of Alfred Adler, who was a contemporary of Freud in 1902. He was one of the first physicians who joined his group of five physicians who were deciding what was wrong with the women of Vienna at that time. And um, after a few years, they diverged philosophically, and Adler developed a psychosocial theory of behavior. And basically what he said is, from what I see about behavior, human beings are always moving in the direction of I need to belong and I need to matter. So belonging and significance. And what happens is we interpret the world in a way through our what he called private logic that our behavior doesn't always look like behavior that's going to give us more belonging or significance. So let me explain how that works. So what I'm going to ask you to do for a moment is um, imagine that you are two and a half years old and you are the only child in a very loving family. Okay? Got it? They love you so much, they think you are so stupendous that they think one is good, two will be better, and in comes a baby. So now you are the oldest child, and you have a baby sibling who's somewhere around a week old, and life is a little different at your house, isn't it? So what do you notice happening differently? Less attention. What else do you notice? Presence for the, grandma brings presents for the baby. The neighbors come over and they want to see the baby. The baby cries and you cry. Who gets picked up first? And who's sleeping in your crib? All sorts of things change. So what you do is you start to make meaning of that because human beings make meaning of their experiences. And how might you make meaning of that? They don't love me as much anymore. The baby's more important than me. So then what you do as a human being is you start collecting data. And you collect the data like, oh yeah, they were hungry, I was hungry, they got fed first, see? You know, you start collecting data to prove your point. And if one of the adults takes you out for ice cream, that data point gets ignored because it doesn't fit the theory. But you gather data to prove that you're right. Now, you laugh about this, but this is one of the reasons we have political problems in our country right now, <laughs> is because everybody's collecting data to prove their point. But that's what human beings do. So if you collect your data and now it's a belief that they love the baby or I'm not as important around here anymore because you're only two and a half, you don't have a big picture of what love is, in order to belong or be important around here, what might you do? You might act out. And we would see that acting out as misbehavior. And it's actually misguided behavior. It's movement toward I need to matter. It's movement toward I need to belong that's not very skilled. What else might you do? Hmm? You might withdraw. Hey, I give up. I'm not going to do that anymore. There's no point. You might act more like a baby. Yeah, because if the baby, that would make sense, wouldn't it? That would solve that problem. You might, you know, give the baby one of those boa constrictor hugs or put it to bed with a pillow across its face because getting rid of the baby would be another solution. And this is done out of conscious awareness. It's just movement toward, I need to belong, I need to matter around here. So what we're going to say is that behavior is a solution to another problem that misbehavior is a solution to another problem. So 
think about that when you see kids doing crazy things. How could this be code for, I need to matter, I need to belong, or how could it be that my, I'm not thinking, and there's part of me that's not here right now because I'm too stressed. So the other big ideas that he played with were um, everybody is equally worthy of dignity and respect. That does not mean as the adult in the relationship that you are the same as the child. This is not about negotiating to, ch to death with kids. You are the leader and that's really, really important. As a parent or as a teacher, it is not your job to keep the children happy. If that were your job, they will begin to believe that I'm loved when I get my way. And that is really a problem. Your job is to be who you are and to be kind and firm at the same time. So we're going to play with that a little bit. So if you're going to be kind and firm at the same time, we'll take a look at what this might look like. If this is high kindness and this is high firmness, high kind and firm at the same time would look like that. What would mostly kind but not very firm look like? Chaos. It might look like chaos. What would we call it? Permissive. You might have a, excuse me, a lot of freedom. It might be kind of wild. All sorts of fun things. How about firmness without much kindness? What would that look like? Authoritarian, right? Might look like more my way or the highway. This is not about love. This is just about style. And we do have families who don't have much firmness or much kindness. It's usually because the family's overwhelmed. Imagine that there's a divorce going on. Imagine that grandma moved in and is dying of cancer. Imagine that there's homelessness. Imagine there's so much going on for the adults that they can't connect with their child. On the other hand, there's other families who have are so busy keeping being busy. You know, there's one kid with clarinet lessons, another one's on select soccer, another one's playing ball doing ballet, and you're only in the car. So there's not much time to connect. So we're going to call that neglect. It's not intentional and there's no um, uh, negative intention or not lack of love. It's just the situation has made it hard for there to be good connection. Now if we go back up here, oh actually before we do that, many adults want children to like them. So let's start here. Until what happens? It gets chaotic and they can't stand the kids. And then they do this. And then they can't stand them. And they do this. So sometimes when we're trying to balance kindness and firmness at the same time, we end up going back and forth and feeling like a teeter-totter, a little out of control. And so what we're going to play with tonight is how do we do kindness and firmness at the same time? And what's tricky about that is that in our culture, kindness is often niceness. And, ki and firmness is a little bit on the mean side. And so they don't fit together. So what I'm going to invite you to think about is this is less about kindness and more about connection. And this becomes connect before correct. So let's talk about what that would look like. What would connect before correct look like? Give me an example of a behavior that happened today or yesterday that kind of bugged you. Yeah? I don't want to brush my teeth. I don't want to brush my teeth. Okay, so how old? Four? Six. Six, okay, that's fine. So six years old, I don't want to brush my teeth. So what would connecting look like? And what you're going to do is think about what's going on here for your child. So what's connect? How could you connect to that? Maybe ask her a question, like, why, why, why don't you want to brush your teeth? So connect first. So, be, so see her. I get it. You'd really rather leave this step out tonight. <laughs> you know, just connect. Just acknowledge it. We're scared to do that because we're afraid it'll be more real. Okay? 
You would rather just skip this step tonight. Done. And we brush our teeth every night. And you get to be firm in that. That's the difference. Not trying to solve, not trying to you know, be nicey-nicey, not trying to fit why, and not a, you'll be on a long story. The truth is, if I, the truth is that when if these bedtime routines and the morning routines, the adults are often stressed. Let's get out of the house in the morning, or it's time for you to go to bed because I'm like this, right? And we want them to hurry along. And do, what happens when we want them to hurry along? Right, they feel like they're roll-on luggage. And when they're roll-on luggage and they want to connect with us, the only thing they know how to do is put on the brakes. Because then you stop and turn around and then you're connected. Does that make sense? So the whole idea is how can I make sure that I connect so that they can slow down and be with them because they need you. The compliment in this is that when a child slows down because they want to connect with you, you know what it means? It means they love you. That's a good news. So it's not a bad thing. It's a nuisance at night, but make time for connection in the morning and at night. And it can be playful connection. It could be brushing your teeth together. Hey, let's do it together. I wonder if we can sing happy birthday or you know whatever song you want to sing while we're brushing our teeth and then clean the mirror off. You know, whatever it is. But play with it, but you don't need to, to bribe with playfulness. It has to come from here. It's not like I'm manipulating with playfulness. Can I make it fun for you so you'll do it? No, this isn't much fun. How can we make it a little more fun tonight? Because then we can snuggle in bed, whatever you're going to do. Is this making sense? Connect first. All right. So everybody, what we're going to do now is we're going to play with that, just so I don't talk too, too long here. I think we've got time for this. Um, we're going to play with that in your body. And I need a volunteer to push on me. Um, and it's not hard work. Come on up. And what's your name? Jimmy. Jim. Yep. Jimmy? Yep. Or Jim? Jimmy. Neither is good. Okay. So I'm going to model what I'm going to do. I'm gonna, you're going to push on me about like that. Okay. Nice and steady and just a push. Now, if I were to be, I'm going to play with the different bodies here. If I were to be, well, actually, you guess. He's going to push? What style is that? Hmm? Mm -hmm. Now he pushed and I moved permissive, right? Okay, he's going to push again. I'm going to get really stiff. He pushes and I resist. And th what style is that? Authoritarian. Okay, go ahead and push. Right. And we rarely do that on purpose. The most common place I see it in the classroom, legitimately, is a teacher's doing something and there's five kids. No, 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 I want you, I want you. And the teacher goes, I can't do it right now. Instead of, I see you and you need to wait. You know, Jonathan, wait. I'll come to you when you're ready. So that whole, that little micro minute of I see you first is really important. It feels weird, doesn't it? Yes, it does. Yeah. All right, so the last thing you're going to do, and you can do these in any order, is something I call think tree. So this is the connect with yourself before correct. And you're going to pretend that you're like a tree and you have deep, deep roots. So you feel your feet down deep into the ground and the trunk of the tree is where you hold your values. This is why you're a teacher, why you like to be a parent, and then you're going to grow like a tree. And you're going to reach up. So in deep breath in, and then breathe it out through your legs and in and feel tall and let yourself kind of settle into that place and you don't have to be protective. He's going to push and I showed him not to push too hard or too fast but when he pushes on me this time, go ahead. Wait, not quite so hard. I'm not ready for that. Okay, try again. I want to practice. I'm learning. Not quite so. Just keep it. I want you to push like that and just keep the pressure on. Got okay? It. So I can just sit here and I hardly move at all. And when he keeps pushing, I actually get stronger, but I'm not pushing back against him in the same way. Can you tell the difference by looking? So practice that. If your partner pushes too hard, tell him to back off. You're learning how to do this, okay? But get the feeling of what it feels like to be really tall and stay in who you are, because that's what your students and what your children want. 
So everybody stand up, find a partner, and before you actually start, we're going to do the tree thing together so you can feel it. So find your partner and stand still. You can go back, thanks. Okay, so everybody take a deep breath. Feel your feet. Notice underneath your feet, feel the bottoms of your feet, and let yourself settle into the floor. And then take a deep breath and extend your spine. You're not going to lift up, it's not stiff. And then breathe out and notice the floor. This is the hard part, staying tall and keeping track of the floor. And then relax your shoulders so you're not all tight, but keep tall, you're reaching from here. So that's what that feels like. So now play with each, uh, play with it, with each other so that you can try all four. And just notice what happens as you do it. And then be really put your feet close together and get really rigid. Oh. Yeah, here you go. Uh-huh. That's rigid. Uh-huh. Okay. That's authoritarian. Right? Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Weird, isn't it? Yeah. See ya. Okay, now really stay in yourself. Uh-huh. And reach up a little bit there. Okay. Now try. Can you feel the difference? Yeah. yeah. Huh? And she can feel the difference too. Even though the position might be the same, the energy is different, isn't it? So play with it again. You feel it? Did you both get a chance to do it? It's kind of fun, isn't it? So the whole idea is when you're working with a student that's kind of pushing your buttons, Breathe and be that tree. Even if you're on your squatting down at their level, your solidness, they can feel the difference. You have more authority from that place. Well, and I've noticed that I've been teaching forever. And I go back to when I was student teaching, and I didn't know any better. But my master teacher was really good, you know, when things were like somebody was talking and they weren't supposed to or whatever. Just, and I kind of learned it from her, and then I've kind of gone away from it. Now I'm trying to come back to it. As she, you know, she would just the connection part for her would be to acknowledge that student, but not in an angry way, just like exactly, exactly. It makes such a big difference. But, you know, you go on and you go on and you forget these little things. Like, you know, that worked really well. It's that connect before correct, and it can be done with a smile. Yeah. It brings the kid back down yeah. here. Yeah. Okay. He just my, had a baby. This is my daughter last she's, night. She's four and he just, he has a, how old is I have a four month, four week old. Four so week this old. is the four year old. <laughs> trying, trying to be the baby in the sink. My wife said that. I love it. <laughs> so now you understand why. <laughs> yes, I was making a lot of connections. Yeah. <laughs> All right. When you're done, have a seat. There's no rush. What I'm trying to promote is that when you are you and you can hold that firmness, that's a form of self-respect. Adler used to talk about mutual respect is I respect myself. I'm going to keep myself in myself and I respect the needs of the situation. So you can be firm and you can also be connected. So we're going to play with connection a little bit more. Um, what I'd like you to do is spend a minute thinking about someone in your childhood who you knew, loved you, cared about you, or to whom you were really important. So an adult in your childhood. Kind of picture that adult. And what I'd like you to do is think about what that adult said or did that conveyed the message that you were cared for or loved. So what was it that they said or did? So we'll write some of those down. What did that adult say or do? Okay. So they kept their promise.
cheered loudly, you said? Cheered. Cheered, cheered at events. We're nurturing. Nurturing. Mm -hmm. Said, I love you. Always asked how the school day was. Asked, how was your day? And I'm guessing they also listen to the response, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So physical touch. You fell asleep. Yep, yeah, so they held you accountable, didn't they? That firmness piece really comes across. I care about you enough that I'm going to set a limit here. You bet. Sometimes we notice that people like that, when you walk into the room, what happens to their eyes? They light up a little bit. They are glad to see you, right? And all of this we call encouragement. And the word encouragement, you can see that there's another word inside there, right? Encourage itself, the word comes from the Latin core, which is Latin for heart. So in some ways, this is the language of love. And when we think about courage, we often think about heroes, like the guy in Kansas who stopped the shooter or, you know, leaped in and got the shooter and got shot himself. And do you remember what he said when he was interviewed? What did he say? Anybody would have done it. I don't think I would have done it. That was him, not me. So one way of looking at courage is it's the movement we make in the direction of being our best self. And you do it too. If you're a parent or if you're a teacher, there's things you do all the time that other people go, really? But that's who you are. So you don't feel courage from the inside, you see it from the outside. And if courage is the movement to become our best self, encouragement is the space we make for someone else to be their best self. And you do that all the time too. Because you're doing this all the time with your children, aren't you? You're listening to them, you're holding them accountable. So just, it's a different way of thinking about encouragement. It's not rah, 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 you can do it. It's who are you? I see you. I recognize you. I actually see you that you're better than you think you are, which is pretty common. Any questions about that concept of encouragement? Okay, so we're going to play with it again. And now I need someone to sit, and I need two people. Um, I'm trying to decide if I'm going to do this in the school version or the kid ver or the family version. I think I'm going to do the family version right now. So I need two people to sit in this chair, and you're going to be siblings. Um, and I'm going to give you, your job will be just to listen to statements that I give you, and then we'll talk about it as afterwards. Two volunteers, I don't bite. <laughs> what are your names? Kathy. Kathy? Jennifer. Jennifer. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Kathy, you are so smart. It's a little hard with all these um, things here. Hold on. I'm okay, I think. You outshined all those other kids. You are the best player on the team. Good girl. Notice what a sibling might be thinking or feeling. I am so proud of you. I wish your sister could be like you. Now, we don't usually say that, but we often, at school especially, we might say, say something like, look how Kathy's sitting. Kathy has her papers out. And that's the same as I wish you could be, the others could be like you. Your painting is beautiful. You know how to please me 100%. You do it just like I told you. I'm glad I sat in this chair. <laughs> <laughs> OK, 
Okay, Jennifer. Thank you for helping me today. It really made my job easier. I care about you. What was most important to you today about what you learned? I trust your judgment. I appreciate you for being you. I can tell you've been working really hard. You can decide that. I trust you to make the decision that's right for you. I have faith in you. It took courage to stand up for yourself like that. Can you tell me more about your painting? Look how much you've learned since two months ago. <laughs> so sometimes when I do this for schools, we leave an empty spot in the middle with a person who doesn't get any. Just to help understand that kids are keeping track of this. And that when we don't say something to them, they notice it. We discourage them without doing anything. But what did you guys notice? Either one can talk. It doesn't matter. I mean, you know, you do. You just, you just want to sit up taller. You just, you, you, uh, you just take it in and you actually become, you become, what, well, mm -hmm. I'm from Bolivia. You become what's spoken. Okay. You know, you become what's spoken to you. Mm -hmm. I kind of agree. You know, when she was giving Kathy all of the cards, I was like, well, what do you want about me? And then I was getting mine and I started feeling pretty good. So, do you want to trade with Kathy? Did you like hers better? No, I like mine better. Uh huh. How come? Uh, I don't know. I felt like you were more vested in what I was doing. Right. It's you interesting. Were connecting with me. <laughs> there was a little more connection here. I noticed that. <laughs> I did. I noticed that. You did. You kind of wish you had hers, huh? <laughs> I just thought, you know, you got down in her face a little bit more than mine. Uh -huh. More than that, the comments were also different. And they, they were different. Mine were more general. You got really specific with her. Hers were specific, but more than that, these were a little judgmental. This was good job. I'm patting her on the head. This is not equal dignity and respect. I'm manipulating her a little bit, aren't I? And these are more about connection. It's more of a horizontal relationship. I'm not giving her, I'm giving her her power. I'm not giving her my power. You feel the difference? So we would call this encouragement and we would call this praise. So they're different. And we make a linguistic distinction because the outcome is very different. So since the 1950s, we've been saying praise them, catch them while they're, you know, catch them while they're good. It'll help build their self-esteem. But if the Cathy's of the world have a diet of this their whole life, how is Kathy going to know she's good enough? How are you going to know? I, I'm not. It's just going to be empty words, pretty much. She's going to have to get someone else's approval. Always. <laughs> but Jennifer, how is she going to know she's good enough? It's going to be internal. This is long lasting. Now you will have kids in classrooms and kids around you who are used to this. And when you move to this, it's hard. Because this is sweet, like this is like a diet like candy. It's very immediately satisfying, but it has no long-term sustenance. But when you go to a healthy diet, it's like, where's my candy? So just be aware that you'll get a little pushback. And you don't have to go off praise cold turkey. You can't if you tried. Just add more encouragement. This is encouragement. All of that is encouragement. You have a lot of encouragement things you can do. Um, I just said, oh, I had one other thought. How many, how many of you know about growth or fixed mindset? Yeah. So which one is growth mindset? This one's growth mindset, right. What other comments from you, the audience? Yeah. Yes. She invited her to self-reflect, didn't it? Mm -hmm. This one, why bother? Dependent learner, independent learner. Yeah. Encouragement? Yes. Mm -hmm. And um, I discovered that I would find kids that when you're doing that, you're very consistently doing it, you'd find kids that would be kind of coming to you like they're so used to the yes. other day. They're like, is this good? Is this yes. good? And when you'd say to them, how do you feel about it? They'd just be like, oh, you don't like it. You'd be like, really? How do you feel about it? Do you like what you did? You know, it's hard. It's a hard transition. Mm -hmm. It is. So, 
themselves. So Even as young children, imagine how hard it is as an adult. Yes. <laughs> and some of us are in that situation, right? Any other comments? Yes. That's another way of looking at it. And the challenge is that the results here are actually externally motivated, so they're not, there's no internal motor around them. Mm -hmm. Short term. Any other questions about that? OK, thank you. So we're going to actually, because what we know about this, um, and you'll notice we're playing with ideas. Do you see what we're doing? Because when we play with them, they become more real. When you can see it and feel it, it makes more sense. And that's why kids need to play. They need to make mistakes. They need to fix their mistakes. They need to learn to take risks and be resilient and come out of them. Because then they, it really, our, our head can understand things, but it's really we do things differently when we get it here. And that's what play does. So what I'm going to have you do is find a partner. And if you came with a partner, that would be a good person to do this with. And what you're going to do is you're going to give each other two descriptive encouragements. And it sounds like this. I noticed. And here's the catch. It doesn't need to be pretty pink and positive. It can be, I noticed that you've had a long day. You're looking a little tired. That's not a, that's just an I see you. It's not a criticism. It could be, um, I noticed that um, you had four cookies today. Um, no judgment. It doesn't have a good, better, best. I noticed you made your bed this morning, but not you made your bed well. It's just I noticed what you did. Okay? I noticed that you're pretty interested in what's going on. Just an I noticed. No good, better, best, and it doesn't have to be fancy. So give each other two I notice statements. Find a partner. Maggie? Maggie? This is kind of what you had in mind? Yes. We're playing. Okay, finish up on your last comment, and we're going to take it up a level. And now we're going to do two appreciative encouragements. And that sounds like, thank you for, or I appreciate. And again, this gets a little harder to avoid the good, better, best, or well, or whatever. I appreciated how helpful you were. I appreciated that you reminded me to get here on time. I appreciate, whatever it was, I appreciated that you emptied the dishwasher yesterday. What, again, without, a, a, no big frilly stuff, just straight and simple. So two I appreciate statements. noticing happening when you do this little role play with each other? 
what happens? You have to pay attention. It's not like a simple pat on the head. Not good job. It's a little more attentive. Mm -hmm. A little more connected. It is intentional. Mm -hmm. It's harder. Mm -hmm. It does. What happened in the room when everybody started giving I appreciate statements? Yeah, there's a little bit of laughter. Some of you may not have known each other very well or at all. And so you might have a little connection now with this person next to you. So I, one other thing that I want to say that the next kind of encouragement, which we're not going to do, is empowering encouragement. And we often do, um, I know you can, I have faith in you, and stuff like that. And the challenge with that, in particular for kids who've had adverse experiences, is that um, they have very sensitive BS meters. So as soon as you say, I know you can, they're not listening anymore because it can't be true. So if you are going to do that, be very careful and use your evidence first. I saw how persistent you were on the monkey bars. With persistence like that, you can. So you're going to have to be very careful. I just want a little warning about that kind of empowering encouragement. All right, so that's great connection. What kind of questions do you have? Well, I just think that's really good. It's so strategic. It, you have to think strategically about this skill and how it can carry forward to this other skill. Exactly. And, and you're the mirror for these children who have heard that they're lazy and stupid and da-da-da-da-da-da-da. And you can say, you know, when you were sitting next to Jimmy and helping, I saw how kind you were with kindness like that, or how patient you were, or how sensitive you were. Things that they don't necessarily see for themselves. And they may go, you know, but you're using your evidence. And that helps kids see themselves in a different light. Now, if you happen to be in a school that does a lot of PBIS, and you end up with sort of these tickets that go, we would view those tickets as praise. And they're very easy to turn into encouragement. Just turn them into I notice statements. I notice blah, blah, blah. And then instead of making it a prize or a competition, give them a little book to keep them in so that they have a record of what they have. So that when they're having one of those days, you could say, how about looking at the book that you have of all the things you've done this year, that people have noticed you. Because what we're trying to do is build their internal reservoir, their resilience. And this is a way that they can use it. It's just a really useful tool. Okay, so just a little way to bridge the gap there. Okay, so we talked a lot about connection, and we're going to talk a little bit about firmness. And I'm going to do this. Um, I want to pay attention because if you do connection without firmness, you're in trouble. The firmness piece is really important. And when people talk about positive discipline, they, it's so nice. We like to be liked. And so it's so easy for us to go into the be nice part. But I really want to not leave today without a piece of firmness. So I need a whole bunch of you up here. And the rest of you can come watch. And I'll tell you what to do ahead of time. So if you choose to be a watcher, you're going to want to move up to see what's happening. If you turn to be a participant, and I'm going to need about 16 or 17 people, what we're going to do is we're going to make two lines. And the lines are going to face each other. So there'll be about eight people in each line. One this way, one facing this way, and one facing this way. And so you're going to be eight people in a line. And then there's going to be one person who's four or five years old. And their job will be to say, but I want to watch that TV program. All right? But I want to. And then the adults are going to have little pieces of paper that are their responses. So you don't have to make anything up. It's all written out for you. You just get to give the response. And the challenging piece is passing the microphone back and forth. So we'll figure out how to do that. So lots of adults. You guys are pass those down blue. You guys get the white ones. You can scoot this way a little bit. Did everybody get a piece of paper? You want to be the kid? Okay, come on down. So we need a one. Or, we need at least one or two more people on the blue line here, and one more on the white line. Yeah. 
No, you stay over there on the white side, sir. <laughs> okay. One more person at least. I, I noticed you were very firm. <laughs> <laughs> Directive. Directive, yeah. Okay. So you get the picture of what you're going to do? I want to watch TV. You want to watch TV. And you don't have to be really creative about it. You can just say, I want to watch my program. And then just listen to the response. And as you do that, notice sort of what's going on. Just notice. Okay? And you're going to go back, kind of back and forth like a zipper. Okay? So go to start in either way. I, I just want to, I want to watch that show. I want to but, watch that yeah. show. I want to watch that show. The answer is no. It's okay to be upset or feel disappointed. <laughs> oh, honey, I know you love the show. Okay, I'll make an exception today. Yeah. <laughs> okay, go, but remember to say I want to watch the show. I want to watch that show. <laughs> I want to watch that show. Okay. okay, fine. Go watch your stupid show. <laughs> I want to watch that show. You can take the show and watch it tomorrow as part of your TV time, or you can just make a better plan tomorrow. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I want to watch that show. No, and you need to stop nagging me now, or you will really have something to complain about. Try again. I want to watch that show. I know you'd rather watch the TV show, but since it isn't an option, I would lo love your help cutting vegetables for dinner. <laughs> <laughs> Just this once, but tomorrow you have to plan better. I want to watch that show. Hmm. Let's hear a little about the team. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great answer, actually. I know. I, know. I want to watch that show. Well, you've been pretty good today, so I guess it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I want to watch that show. In our house, we only watch TV for one hour a day. We've already done that today. It's okay. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I want to watch that show. No. You know better. If you're going to pout about it, you can just go to you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I want to watch that show. I wonder if you can figure out a way to make sure you can follow the house rules and still watch your favorite show in the future. She's like a future. I want to watch that show. No, honey, you know you can't do that. Now don't get upset. You can come to the store with me later and I'll get you a toy. Oh! oh. <laughs> <laughs> I want to watch that show. I trust you to figure out a way to plan for the show you really want to watch in the future. <laughs> <laughs> One more. I want to watch that show. Well, you know you've already watched an hour already, but if you help me with the laundry later, I'll let you watch an hour. Um. <laughs> <laughs> What's your name? Oh. Erica. Erica. So Erica, what did you notice? Mm, I noticed a lot of different responses. <laughs> yeah. So there was a little bit of a difference in the two sides, right? Yeah. So do you have a characterization about what you notice in different sides? Mm. I liked a lot of these responses better. You like these guys better? Yeah. How come? Uh, it was a little more reflective and felt a little bit more empowering sometimes. Isn't that interesting? These felt more empowering. They were a clearer boundary. So it wasn't this wiggle room stuff. And it felt more empowering. Anything? Any comments about these? Mm, felt kind of dismissed sometimes. Uh huh. Uh huh. And are you making any decisions about these adults, this group or this group, or about yourself? Making decisions. Yeah. I got. I was making a decision if I got to watch the show or not. Yeah. And what did you decide? I, With these guys. That I wasn't going to get to watch the show. <laughs> That's pretty clear, isn't it? <laughs> Not today, anyway. Yeah, not today. How about these guys? 
Uh, I usually got to watch the show. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, or I got to, yeah, I got, so, I got some sort of... Or you got something threatened. Or, or threatened yeah. or a toy or something like that. Or sent to your room. Or sent to your room. I feel like I was being manipulated to them. So. Ah, it kind of invited you to be manipulated of, manipulative of them. The, you, I could, you could manipulate. Well, I can play them. I yeah. like I uh-huh, I can play them. Mm-hmm. Or I was getting a lot of pushback. And I'm like, uh-huh. So what did the adults notice? Any comments? They were authoritarian and permissive. Uh-huh, either one, sort of, yeah. uh-huh. And these guys? <laughs> Firm and connected, very the clear. <laughs> you can watch it in the future. Yeah. We connected with her emotions. We were like, I know that you want to watch it, but you know, uh-huh. like we uh, understood. Yeah. Or we get it. You want to watch it, and we trust you to solve the problem in the future. So it's a different kind of firmness than we're used to often. Yeah. I also heard a lot of just shaming and blaming. Do we ever do that? Yes. I see way more people. Yeah, so how about the, you guys can sit down if you want. Thank you, Erica. Yeah. Thank you. Any comments from the rest of you? Yes. In this one, they were definitely in charge. At the same time, they were very respectful and full of dignity. They were in charge, but it was still connected. The, over here. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because the parent was trying to keep the child happy or something. Mm-hmm. That allows your child to be in charge. Kind of scary thought. Yes. If I can get this, this is where the kids get to believe I'm loved when I get my way. And it's really hard when they make the transition to school because they can't get their way in school. And then their behavior goes down the tubes. Okay, yes? Some of them were and some of them weren't. Like one of them was just touch the shoulder and shake your head. That's really simple. Or I see it and it's okay to be disappointed. Pretty simple. So there was a variety on both sides. But the difference is this is connected but still firm. The answer is no. The answer over here was it could be no but it was no with no, or some kind of other energy, or it was a waffle. Mm-hmm. Do you have a question? No, I had a comment. Um, this really reminds me, anyway, of my upbringing, where one parent was always one way, the other parent was the other way, and you knew how to play them differently what you wanted. Right? So the interesting thing, sometimes people ask me, well, what if one parent's permissive, and I, and you know, what if my partner's permissive and he or she isn't going to change? Here's the answer to that. When one parent is here, the other parent compensates by going here. And when this parent is way over here, this parent compensates by going more here. And then they compensate and they get farther and farther away. So if you want to change the system, all you have to do is move here. And that other parent will move in. So as you move to being connect before correct, the other parent's behavior will be either less firm in, in a negative way or less permissive in a negative way. So one parent can change the whole dynamic. Any other questions? Yes. They were like this, weren't they? 
sometimes. Mm -hmm. And what does that do to the child, do you think? It's scary. Yes. It's confusing and a little scary. So our job as adults is to really hold on to that. And it's hard. And you will not be perfect. So one more other one other big idea is that in this work that we do, one of the big ideas is that mistakes are always opportunities to learn. And we have learned over time that, mistake, that when someone makes a mistake, we teach them by hurting them. It's interesting that we have a sense that if someone does something wrong, we have to have a consequence, we have to have an impact so that they will get it. And the craziness about that is we are implying that in order to feel do better, they have to feel worse first. And especially for people who've had adverse experiences in their childhood, that actually makes their resiliency window smaller. You don't need to feel bad in order to do better. You need to be seen and heard and have another opportunity to solve the problem. Our, the children we work with, they know when they make a mistake. They already feel bad. In fact, they feel bad enough, they have trouble um, disconnecting from I am bad versus I feel bad. And so that sense of I am bad is a sense of shame that they carry with them. So when we teach them about the brain and the hand and we teach them that people make mistakes, the question is, okay, you made a mistake, that wasn't okay to hit him. How are you going to make the repair? Safety first, and then how are you going to make the repair? That sense of, oh, you know, three plus four is not two. How are you going to make the repair? It, it applies to academics and it applies to interpersonal relationships. So part of the skill building is actually teaching, oh, I made a mistake, what am I going to do about it? That sense of capability that comes from being able to make your own, to fix your mistakes. And adults do that too. And one of my stories, my favorite stories from my own kids where they taught me this is we, were, we went to parenting class because um, when my daughter oldest went to kindergarten, her behavior was awful. And I thought, in, oh no, she went to first grade. Kindergarten was fine. Then she went to school all day. And it was like, ugh, she was awful at home. So we went to the school and basically said, what have you done to my child? And they said, what do you, how do you parent? And they sent us off to parenting classes. At which point we learned how to do some repairs. And you don't think your kids are learning it. And my middle child was four and we were doing a house remodel and I had to go to this warehouse, this plumbing warehouse. And I had a two-year-old on my hip and a four-year-old. And so we go into this building that doesn't normally have you know, clients or consumers because it's a, a warehouse. And my four-year-old is like, there's all these gadgets on the wall. It was like magnetic attraction to the gadgets. And the woman in the store yelled at him and said, don't you touch that! And he turned around at me and he looked and he had tears in his eyes. He says, mommy, we have to go. I'm thinking, I'm not done with my errand. I'm not ready to go, but we're going to go. So we leave out of the store. We go out the door and he says, he says to me, you have to make her apologize. Now this is the first clue that I've gotten that he actually is resonating with the kind of work we're doing at home. And I'm thinking, I have to go make her apologize? And then it occurs to me, our parenting instructor said, if you don't know what to do, don't do anything, breathe. So I sat down with him, there's this big toilet full of flowers outside, and I said, I don't think I can make her apologize, but I'll go in with you if you want to ask for an apology. And I'm thinking, ha, got him. <laughs> Wrong. He says, okay. <laughs> so in we go, and this four-year-old goes up to this woman who's just yelled at him and goes, you shouldn't have yelled at me. I'd like an apology. <laughs> and I thought, and she goes, I'm really sorry. I was afraid you'd hurt yourself. And he looks at me and says, Mom, we can go now. <laughs> and so, so then we leave again. And I'm sitting there kind of stunned because no way could I have done that as a four-year-old. Kind of, and he's sitting in his little seat and I'm going, wow. He says, I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> it was hilarious. It was just one of those humbling times when you go as a parent, you know, they're more capable than we think they are. But what we do really matters. And what we've been doing is modeling 
you know what, I yelled at you and I shouldn't have yelled at you and I'm sorry. And whatever, you know, mistakes that we made. We just started modeling apologies and asking for apologies from the kids. And, they, you know, it never felt like it was sinking in, but there he was. So those are the kinds of things that help you connect with your kids and play with them. So I want to say one other thing, and that is we as adults have our own history of how we connected with our own family. We have our own history of how we played or didn't have an opportunity to play with our own kids. So when I had kids, I struggled to play with them. They taught me to play. I never got really good at it, but they taught me. But I had to let myself be taught because I wasn't a kid who got to play as a, as a little person. So what I do know is that they're better at playing than I ever was. And I think they will be better with their kids than I ever was with my kids. But let your kids teach you to play. Have fun with them. Connect with them. Because they can teach you. They have it inherently. They long to connect. They long to play. And they'll do a better job than you will. But you'll have to turn your phone off, and you'll have to turn the TV off, and you'll have to do all that kind of stuff to do it. Because you can't connect with that thing in the middle. They need it, and their brains need it to grow. So with that, if I, we have a few more minutes if there's questions, or we can have about five more minutes of conversation. I think the parents who have children, they're probably really close to being ready to have go get them. Yeah. <laughs> so, oh, I, I warned them, they're starting to clean up, but a couple more minutes, they yeah. probably need to go rescue the um, child care provider. <laughs> Everyone's safe and happy. Yeah. Yeah. The, yeah, the answer is as much as you can. One of the things that my kids also taught me was like, I, I was a physician, I come home and it's like, I gave it the office, right? I didn't have much. And then I'd try and make dinner, and they were like, nye, 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 nye. So what I learned was, and what they taught me was, when I came home, the first thing I had to do was play with them. So we had a process where we made a snack so that we could just pull the snack out of the refrigerator, which gave us another 15 or 20 minutes, and we just played. And whether we played Love Trap Monster or Hot Lava or whatever it was, it was some kind of physical connection game. Some days we were just too tired and we sat down and read. But the connection you make when you re-engage with them is really important. And then if you have more than one child, having some private time every week with each child. And it doesn't have to be long, but it has to be directed by them. But in the morning you need to connect, they need to connect, when you return, they need to connect. And before they shut down for the night, they need to connect for sure. You will play with, you know, you will see, if you let it go, that the play at nighttime revs up to get crisis level. So you have to be a little intentional about how to do de-escalating play at night. And one of the things I taught my kids, because they'd play with each other at night too and it would get rough, is are you still having fun? And that they teach them to say, no, I'm not having fun anymore, or stop means stop. Because if they're have roughhousing, and, and I would say, are you still both having fun? If one of them said no, it was time to stop. That was my way of kind of just um, settling it in. When they get older, they had a lot of time for just playing with themselves, too, with each other. Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, I have a uh, son who's five years old autistic. Yeah. Well, you know, there is a lot of interesting information on autism, and I'm not an autism s specialist. However, the work of Stanley Greenspan is fascinating. I don't know if you've read his book. But um, basically he says that his theory about autism is that kids come out in early infancy, and what happens is they're so sensitive, the connection is actually painful. And so they avoid connection, and then they don't get the mirror neurons, and it sort of goes downhill. And he, he if you're interested to play with that, I recommend a book called um, The Boy Who Loved Windows. And it talks about a boy who's autistic, where they really did connect, and it was hard, hard work 
but after four or five years, he was neurotypical. He looked neurotypical. Now, Dr. Greenspan's data shows about 60% of the kids he worked with that way were able to change their nervous system. Not all of them. So you can look up the DIR floor time model. It's a pretty standard model, and it's what you know. That's where I go first when I talk to families about autism. It's really hard because their nervous system, and you have mirror neurons, and when they're hurting, you hurt. And so then we pull away, and the question is, should we be pulling in? But take, go exploring yourself, and find the people that work best for you. Yeah. Any other questions? Thank you all for spending this night in, in May, in mayhem.